Okay, let me just. Okay. So my interest is not in individual action in motor control, but in joint action. So um, I think you, you got an impression this morning, you probably all know uh, how difficult it is um, to understand how people perform simple actions just, just, uh, such as walking and so on. But of course, uh, it gets more tricky when people uh, try to do things together. Um, let me just start with a, a definition and then I show you an example. So uh, by joint action, I mean any social interaction whereby two or more individuals coordinate their actions in space and time to bring about a change in the environment. And in order to do that, what they need to do in addition, in, in addition to um, uh, individual action is actually co uh, coordinate their actions with one another. So uh, the type of actions I'm thinking of is not you know, uh, uh, writing on a uh, paper together. That would be also be a joint action. But uh, the ones I'm most interested in is where some uh, real-time coordination is required, as in this example. Or in another example <laughs> that I want to show you, it's not this one, uh, where you can. Just an example from Fessio. And uh, what, I find, what I find interesting about this example is that in a sense, you know, if you, if you look at people who are interested in high-level cognition, they would, I think, have to say that not so much is going on as people are performing this action. But in a sense, if you look at what needs to happen in order to make uh, the skilled action happen, um, it's actually quite fascinating, and a lot of it uh, is coordination in real time. And uh, we have a sort of uh, research program in psychology where we try to find out different components of people's ab abilities to achieve that coordination. Okay, and I, I would like uh, to just give you an overview of some of our research where we have performed uh, experiments in order to identify different such uh, coordination strategies. And what I, uh, here are five different processes that uh, I will go through, um, starting with one that assumes actually that people don't represent or know anything about each other at all and don't uh, do any planning together, um, that's entrainment. Then I go to, uh, um, um, basically mecha mechanism uh, speeding, where people actually um, um, try to alter their own task performance in order to allow a better coordinated joint action. Then I talk about simulating the partner's action, monitoring the partner's actions, and about haptic signaling. I think all of these processes could actually be interesting uh, also in the context of robotics, because I think one big issue in uh, robotics at the moment is um, you know, how do you make robots perform actions together, right? Okay, so the first process I'm going to talk about is entrainment. Please ask questions, by the way, if you, um, if you want to. So, uh, um, this is a purely uh, physical process that can do a lot, actually, for coordination. And um, 
our dynamical systems uh, researchers have pointed this out because they were interested as joint action as, uh, in joint action as one case of entrainment uh, where you could actually have um, uh, a look at informational coupling. So who of no, you knows what entrainment is? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so um, I, I'll explain it for a moment. So entrainment is a, uh, a principle that actually originates in physics um, and it was discovered by Christian Heuchens, uh, a Dutch uh, researcher, and he was interested in clocks, uh, generally speaking, because this was at a time where navigation was um, uh, still quite difficult, and clocks played a uh, very uh, important role in solving some of these problems. And uh, he discovered that two clocks hanging on the same wall will gradually synchronize. And the general uh, principle behind this is that physically coupled oscillating systems adapt the same period. And there's a nice uh, demonstration on the internet of that. So what's, uh, what's uh, crucial here, if you take metronomes, and they, you can see that they are out of phase, right? They are not, they are not moving, uh, they are not having the same oscillation. What the guy is going to do is he will put them onto these two objects. And this uh, creates a sort of uh, physical coupling between them that rapidly leads them to get into the same phase. So, you know, there's no cognition whatsoever here. Right? So it's just uh, different objects uh, being in uh, different uh, in the oscillations with different phases initially, and just by through this sort of physical connection, um, they tend to synchronize. I think you get the idea. <laughs> All right. Now the idea of uh, of uh, uh, researchers in psychology who are sort of attracted as, uh, to dynamical systems as an explanatory principle is that similar as the physical coupling you, coupling, you can actually have an informational coupling between people that works in a very similar manner. So um, Mike Richardson is one of the main people who has developed this approach lately. And uh, I just want, to, want you to uh, describe uh, one experiment um, to you that I found particularly nice to illustrate this. So uh, what he did is, uh, is he wanted to know whether people, even if you instruct them to uh, rock in a particular frequency, whether they actually, when in, in rocking chairs, whether they actually synchronize. And even synchronize when the natural rocking frequency of the chairs differs, okay? So what he did in the experiment is you can have these rocking chairs and you can put weights into rocking chairs. And what happens when you put a weight in a rocking chair is that its natural frequency, its natural rocking frequency actually gets slower, okay? So um, if you have one person sitting uh, in a rocking chair that has a weight on it, and if you have another person sitting on a rocking chair that doesn't have a weight on it, they actually should you know, be desynchronized. And the question was that do people nevertheless actually fall into the same pattern, working actually against the natural frequency of these rocking chairs? And the way you can actually look at that in psychological experiments is that you look at the relative phase of, uh, of two movements, two oscillating movements, as uh, they occur. So for instance, for a rocking chair, the relative phase of the movement, uh, if they move like that, would be zero degrees, okay? So that's in phase. If they move like that, it's anti-phase. That's 180 degrees. And then, you know, you can have, you can have uh, uh, relative phases in between. Does that make sense to you? Yeah? Okay. So if people are moving independently from one another, what you would uh, actually expect in a graph like this is 
uh, an equal distribution across all these phases. If people have a tendency to fall into the same uh, rhythm, if they show entrainment effects, what you would expect is that you get, you get a, a higher frequency for a relative phase where they're, where they're in the zero degree phase relation. Yeah? Okay? And this, this is what he looked at in an experiment where he had uh, pe two people rocking alongside each other uh, on these uh, chairs that had different natural frequencies. And uh, in one condition, they, were, they only saw each other in the periphery. And in the other condition, they were looking at one another. And they were instructed to keep their act own frequency. And what you can see is that in the condition where um, you know, they had only peripheral vision of one another, um, there was not, uh, it looks uh, really like a little bit like an independent distribution. So they were basically moving independently in all of the three conditions. So the black line means uh, they, they had the same rocking chairs, and the white lines stand for conditions where one person was sitting in a, in a rocking chair that had a weight in it and was sort of naturally rocking more slowly, and the other, uh, so, so that's the two white lines. Now look at what happens when, once people start to look at each other. And you can immediately see that in all of these three conditions, um, basically what happens is that uh, people fall into these same patterns, right? Do you see that? Because you have a higher frequency in this zero degree phase relationship. And the most interesting thing I think of the experiment is that this doesn't only happen when they have uh, rocking chairs that you know, tend themselves to, to have the same natural frequency, but this even happens if you know, one person has a slow rocking chair and the other person has a much, um, a much uh, faster rocking chair. So that in a sense what people are doing in order to entrain, and this is a, a completely unconscious uh, process really, um, is they act against the, the, uh, the natural frequencies of these uh, artifacts. Okay? So here we have a process uh, that you could, yes? Uh, so I think it's, it's not the same as the physical coupling that we saw with the metronomes, of course, right? Because there's no, there's no physical, rela I think, you know, there was, they weren't on the skateboard, <laughs> so to say, right? So there was no physical re uh, relationship between them that would have, uh, physical coupling between them that would allow, have them allowed to sort of synchronize. But there was informational coupling between two cognitive systems. So this is how the uh, dynamical systems uh, people would describe it. But they would say the same thing for fireflies, yeah? So, you know, if uh, there are swarms of fireflies that start to act in synchrony, and they would say it's exactly the same principle, yeah? So it's not, it's not a human social phenomenon, let's say. It's a very basic uh, uh, process, so to say, uh, that could occur in a wide range of animals. No intentionality, no representation, no nothing, really. Um, can you tell a little bit more about the actual paradigm? Are they sitting um, beside each other and then... It's yes, like sorry. So uh, the paradigm was um, basically you have two rocking chairs in the room and in the peripheral vision condition, they also had a no vision condition where you know they looked away from each other. It looks quite similar to the peripheral. Um, and basically they were instructed to rock uh, in the rocking chair and basically, normally, what they do is they adapt to the to the to the natural frequency of the chair, and then they did this for 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 um, in all conditions for for a minute or so, and then you know uh, they were either instructed to keep looking away from each other, or they were then instructed to look at each other. But not to interact in any way. No. No. I mean, they var they manipulate this so. Uh, generally, what you get is you get the same result for intentional coordination and unintentional coordination in these paradigms. Uh, there are several other paradigms in that did work with pendulums and so on. So this is a very general finding, actually. I just like the rocking chairs uh, because 
um, people work against these natural frequencies. And I think that makes the finding very, very strong, actually. Are there more questions? OK, so that, that was the first process where actually that actually sort of leads to synchronization or, or coordination between people without any explicit uh, intention to coordinate, right? It just draw. It, it's, it's, it is as if you get drawn into coordination, and um, um, such a process can uh, could also do a lot in 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 the context of uh, intentional joint action. Okay. Uh, a second process, so this, this is entrainment, okay? A second way in which people can achieve coordination with one another is to actually sort of um, alter their own task performance in the context of the joint action. This uh, uh, will uh, probably require some sort of mental representation, what, whatever you want to call it, some sort of uh, control parameter um, that um, actually um, involves, you know, knowing uh, what you want to, uh, what kind of effect you want to observe in the environment, uh, and the sort of role uh, distribution between self and other. And I'm going to ta only talk about two people situations, actually. And one, uh, surprisingly, one effective uh, strategy to coordinate is to s just speed up. Um, and uh, there's a there's a, a, a finding in experimental psychology or in social psychology that's called social facilitation. And uh, we performed some experiments where we actually um, want to suggest that, uh, especially Cordula Vespa, um, that perhaps social facilitation uh, serves so at least sometimes a coordination uh, purpose. So it's very well known in social psychology that people speed up when they are in the same room, performing this, the same tasks together, compared to you know, uh, performing tasks individually. So this is known as social facilitation. And normally, this has a sort of you know, a really social, emotional explanation. So the classical interpretation of social facilitation is that um, people have a heightened arousal. So you know, you're sort of, sort of a bit nervous you know, when another person is in, in, in the other room. You have high excitement, higher, you're more awake, so to say. Um, and uh, that is why you speed up. However, if you speed up, if you go to your limits you know, in running, or if you go to your limits in you know, any performance, uh, you also reduce variability. It's, it's a simple statistical uh, fact, right? That uh, as, you, as you go to your limits in performance, variability goes down. Yeah. It could be a different. It could be different tasks. Okay. I, I mean, social facilitation is a very general finding. I want to have a particular reading here for for the coordination case, actually. Yeah. Um, but I think it's true both for coordinated action as well as non-coordinated action. Um, so our idea here is that speeding actually uh, reduces uh, variability in timing. And um, thus, uh, the speeding could actually reflect a strategy. So if you want to coordinate with one another, with another person, and you don't know that person, and you don't know quite well what the task is, but you know what you want to achieve together, perhaps it's just a good idea to speed up. And you know, for, for the other person uh, to do the same. So, uh, speeding may reflect attempts to improve coordination when you, when you can't specify the, the other task very well. Yes? So did I understand it right that the yeah. reason that reduces variability is that the upper limit of people's performance tends to be similar? Yes, it, it, you, you sort of hit the performance limit and that's you know, why, you, why you can't go, you don't have variability in one direction, so to say. You know, if you're, if you if your sort of reaction in, in a particular uh, a psychological task, say if your limit is 300 milliseconds, yeah, then you know if you ca can't go below it and you try to be as fast as possible, uh, your variability will go down. Another you know psychological finding where you could actually observe that is that it's very hard to synchronize with long for long time intervals, right? So if you have to synchronize with an is isochronous um, 
signal, right? As the intervals become longer, you really produce much more variability. It's sort of, it's a similar sort of observation. Yes. So, um, it, it you know uh, it uh, it really depends. So if if you have two people with two different performances, it it probably would be a bad strategy. Yeah. But if you have uh, two people who um, uh, who are both <coughs> both novices, which will be the case in the experiment, perhaps you know it's a, it's a good one uh, or a good first one until you uh, let's say you know do other things from from a model of the other person and so on. We come to that. I just want to make the point that you know many people think that when you coordinate with, with one another, especially in, the so, especially in the social cognition literature, you know it's, it's very fashionable to think that you'd have to simulate the task of the other person. I believe that that is also true, but there's there are simple ways of sort of uh, and very general ways of of uh, sort of uh, changing your own performance in order to improve the likelihood for making coordination possible. That's a simple point here. Okay, so speeding could be a, a general strategy to improve coordination to adjust one's own task performance to achieve coordination. It could be an intention, lead to an intentional reduction of variability. And it does not require predicting or monitoring uh, a partner's tasks and actions. And you know, I'm an experimental psychologist, so if you, if you want to, tr to try to test an assumption like that, you take this most minimal, this most simple <laughs> sort of paradigm. So our poor participants had to perform very stupid tasks. Uh, and the, the tasks wa was uh, that in, in one experiment, we asked them to respond to red and green stimuli. And uh, um, you, know, you just press uh, left for the red and right for the green stimulus, OK? Very, very simple task. Um, and uh, in one experiment, we asked them to respond as synchronously as possible with their partner, so at the same time. So there was an explicit coordination requirement. And in the other uh, experiment, we asked them uh, to just perform the task individually. That would be sort of the normal social facilitation uh, type experiment. Okay, and at the same time, respond as fast and as accurate as possible to the stimulus. So that. Uh, that was an instruction in both experiments. And what we are, go what we are looking at now is their reaction times. And that would be the same pattern in both experiments. So um, if you look at the reaction times in the uh, individual condition, you can see that uh, across the whole experiment, um, the reaction times are much uh, slower in the individual condition than in the uh, joint condition. Or they are faster in the joint condition than in the individual condition. Do you see that? And there's no, no learning effect whatsoever. So that, you know, that's true right away. So that's a classical facilita uh, social facilitation pattern. But what also happens is, uh, as predicted, basically this, uh, the standard deviation goes down in the joint condition. So the faster reaction time uh, goes hand in hand with the lower variability. But can we say that this is an attempt on the participants' uh, side to, uh, to reduce variability? No, we can't. Give, just giving these data patterns, you know, it could be anything. Thus we performed a second analysis. So basically what we are looking at here is the correlations between reaction times, variability, and asynchrony between the two reactions of the people. So that's the time difference between the two reactions. Yes? Does that make, does that make sense? So the asynchrony, we, we talked about RTs, variability, that's an in individual parameters, and the asynchrony is just uh, the, the time difference between the two reactions. Yeah? And we look at the correlations between these variables. And what we see is that basically the speed up in uh, reaction times in the, in the experiment where we, ask, where we don't ask people to uh, coordinate, that basically there's a direct relationship between 
uh, reaction times and asynchrony. So basically longer reaction times mean more difference between the two people and shorter reaction times mean less difference between the people. And this relationship is not mediated by variability at all. So that's against our hypothesis, okay? So you know whether it's, it's variable or not doesn't matter at all. But note that this is the joint unintentional condition where we didn't ask people to coordinate, yeah? The interesting finding though is that in the condition where we ask people to be synchronous, this uh, a correlation pattern changes. Because what happens here is that uh, now, basically, the main route is not directly from the reaction times to the asynchrony, basically, but uh, between the reaction times, they lead to um, lower variability, uh, lower va so lower reaction times, lower va variability, and lower variability means lower asynchrony here. So in this experiment, basically, the speeding has the effect, basically people seem to speed up in, in order to um, reduce variability so that a synchrony can be in, introduced. And just so, to um, explain perhaps uh, the analysis a bit further, we also computed partial correlations between these parameters. So what you can see here is that um, if you do partial correlations where you sort of uh, remove the correlation between these two from the correlation between these two, nothing remains of the correlation between variability and asynchrony. Whereas in the upper graph, if you remove the variability uh, with, a, uh, sorry, the correlation between variability and asynchrony from the correlation between reaction times and asynchrony, nothing remains. So it's really this route uh, that uh, starts to matter. I think this is also pretty clear uh, experimental evidence that uh, people actually use the speeding up strategy um, um, in order to achieve coordination. Okay. So the averages of the reaction times different between these two conditions? Sorry? The averages of the reaction times? No, different. they are the same. They're exactly the same. So you know, uh, so it's really, uh, they're not, in a sense, you know, these, uh, the relationships are really different, um, although the, the overall performance is the same. Mm -hmm. But something completely different seems to happen in these relationships. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, you know, this, so that this pattern would really be sort of the, the normal uh, social facilitation pattern, whereas here you really have a speeding strategy that you could mis misinterpret as social facilitation. That would be our strong conclusion. I mean, we, you know, from one, ex from one, one series of experiments, it's quite hard to say, but I think that I, I want to make a gen more general point here. Uh, you know, if you, if you, if you think about uh, joint action coordination, don't only think about, you know, um, entrainment or you know simulating the other person. We will do that in a moment. Also think what what can I do? What can I do to uh, make the coordination better? And speeding is a, is an example for that. There might be others. I mean we are just slowly identifying different things here. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about how how people come to that because it's it's sort of somehow unintuitive. Do you, is this a long experiment where they learn to do that? No, it's not. So the, these uh, relationships, uh, if, you, if you go block by block, they remain the same. So this is the, this is the stunning thing, actually. It doesn't change across experiments. People just do it right away. So you know, it has to be some sort of prior experience. And we have, we have, actually, we have actually observed this in different uh, contexts where we, you know, we thought uh, people actually should learn in our experiments. But if you, I think whenever we did experiments where we had where people didn't know a lot about each other uh, and were novices, we tend to see you know, these more general strategies. And they don't rapidly improve. Yeah. If I understood your data correctly, they are faster when they try to synchronize than when you tell them to do as fast as possible. No, uh, in, in both conditions, they had the, uh, the instruction to respond as fast and accurate as possible. That is a standard instruction. But in one experiment, they had, uh, they, they had sort of only the individual condition without a coordination constraint, whereas in the other condition, in the joint intentional, they had the additional instruction to also be as synchronously as possible. Right, but in the individual one, they seem to have been slower than in the synchronized one. 
Uh, but we, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I, I, I didn't explain that well. Um, in both uh, experiments, we had an individual condition and a joint condition. So in, bo in both the joint intention and joint unintentional, you would see exactly such a pattern. I, I'm ju I just show it for one experiment. But the joint seems to be faster, right? Around 340 and the yes. So they are faster when they try to join, when they do a joint versus when they do it by themselves. Yes. So they, they push the limit further than that. So what do you, how do you explain the fact that they are not really as fast as possible when they do it individually? Um, that's a good question. I mean, uh, they, they don't seem to go to their performance limits. That's, uh, that seems to be the conclusion. Um, there are all sorts of reasons, but, um, but I think the more interesting finding is that, um, you know, in, in both cases here, you, you have the same difference, but um, uh, the role of variability is completely different in the two cases. And that's where sort of the main conclusion comes from. But uh, I, I agree with your observation that um, you know, this is sort of uh, uh, social facilitation in general, the riddle of social facilitation that actually, you know, when you do things together with other people, you, you, uh, you, get, you give more, you, know, you perform, you go more to your performance limit. I wonder if in this type of experiment, I wonder if it also with the rocking chairs, there are sometimes conditions where you instruct one of the subjects to synchronize and the other to do individual and see how it affects the entrainment? Yeah, I think that would be interesting. I'm not sure whether that has been done. Yeah. I think we, we have tried this sometimes and, and then the findings uh, get messy. <laughs> so, uh, and I think Mike Richardson has tried the same thing, you know, in his paradigms. It's, uh, it's a little bit non-obvious, let's say. Uh, it's more a, a problem of the experimental technique than anything else, I think. Yes? Uh, do you think it's a cross-cultural phenomenon? Uh, which, uh, the speeding or the entrainment? No, in, or in both? general, I mean, the, the fact Are there cultural differences in yeah, these things? Yeah, there are cultural differences, have you tested it, and, and how did you make up like, a sample, like, for example? Right. Or do they belong all to the same culture or to the same social environment? Right. I think my standard assumption would be um, um, that uh, these, are, these are universal, but I'd be very open to the possibility that uh, there are cultural differences, and I find it very interesting. Um, at the moment, I, 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 don't, I don't yet see sort of a principled way of postulating these differences, let's say. Okay, so if I, if I had a, a sort of theoretical reason for postulating them, uh, I, uh, I'd be very interested in... Uh, in this, of course, uh, of, there's a potential rela relationship with, uh, you know, sort of a, a very, very shallow way of reading cultural differences, which is sort of, you know, the holistic Asian versus um, uh, more detailed sort of Westerner. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe one should predict that uh, the effects are larger in Asia. Um, but you know, it's a bit of a shallow. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Yeah, okay. yeah, Kevin. I didn't quite understand. I'm a bit confused because you showed the graph where you said that the reaction times were shorter. In, and just a minute in reply to Andreas, you said the reaction times were the same in these two. Oh, I'm sorry. Between these two conditions. I think what creates the confusion is that here I should have had two pairs of graphs from the two experiments. Because what I'm showing here is a data pattern that holds in the joint intentional condition as well as in the joint un unintentional condition. So in fact, uh, um, the data that I show you here are from the joint unintentional condition, but the data from the joint intentional condition look exactly the same, okay? And uh, although <laughs> this is the case, uh, these relation the relationships between the different data are the same. So it's, it's a matter of not so good presentation, I guess. So would this change with feedback? Maybe feedback about? If you would give feedback about the degree of synchrony, for instance, to the subjects. I think they got that because the, um, uh, you know, they hear clicks from the, uh, from. Uh, well, right, they hear clicks, okay. So if you would not, if you would eliminate the feedback, would this destroy your result problem? I think no. And the reason why I think no because is you need, you need some sort of feedback, right? I think I we mean, should have. Can it work without any feedback? I think we should have done this. I think we should have done this, but my hunch is 
that both of them are working on their own task, ignoring each other. And I think we have done an experiment without feedback, and it was sort of, you know, we had, we had problems with significance, but we basically got the same results. So I think it's, it's really more a sort of a priori strategy rather than something that we require during experiments, because I think, you know, if, if, if they would notice that, uh, that uh, speeding up helps them with the experiment, you'd also expect, uh, at least in a joint in, uh, intentional uh, condition, you'd expect a, a learning curve across the different blocks, and that's also not something that we see. So that's, that speaks against uh, feedback-related experiments. Uh, when, when you would look at the individual trials in block one, in block two, and so forth, would there, at least in the beginning, be some structure in the sequence of the trials? We wouldn't know because there's too much variability in, the, uh, in the data. Yeah. If it needs some feedback, there must be some, you know, approaching each other type of change. I think, you know, in other experiments, we have an indication that you need nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Another quick question. Um, so in some uh, perceptual tasks, if you speak them up, you make more mistakes. Like in training, it's also lead to a loss of accuracy. Yeah. You mean in training or speeding well, strategy? Well, could, because you, <coughs> in some perceptual tasks, if you did them too quickly, you make more mistakes. You haven't received as much mm -hmm. information about mm -hmm. the decision you're trying to do. So, could in training, if yeah. it causes you to speed up, also cause you to make right. more mistakes? I mean, that's a very interesting question. I mean, that is also something we are trying to do more and more. It's a bit hard to do experimentally, but you know how. How do these different coordination patterns work together? And again, my hunch is that there is a possibility, at least initially, that more basic process, I would see entrainment as the most basic one, actually, that they actually make people, that you could actually uh, you know, uh, create a situation where people actually start making mistakes because they want to be, because they are entrained. Yeah. I think it would be, yeah, I have to think about it. It would be good experiments, I think, be nice. Okay, all right, but we don't want to be so ignorant, right? So uh, I started with the simple coordination strategies, but of course, you know, if you think about uh, the skilled action that I showed you in the video, um, I think it's also the case that especially if you want to perform very skilled joint actions with another person, um, that uh, you, you um, have to simulate, or if you share sort of uh, action experience, uh, uh, with another person, if you know you know how to do the same actions, um, that you also simulate the other's actions, that that actually helps you um, with uh, the coordination. So the simulation uh, pertains more uh, to the other's actions. So what you do there, or uh, what the hypothesis is that um, is that you, for instance, simulate the time it takes another person to perform an action and plan your action accordingly, okay? So this, it's a sort of uh, parasimulation. And Giovanni, has, have you talked about this on Monday? A little bit, okay, so uh, it's in the same uh, sense. I'm just, okay. So another way to achieve temporal coordination during joint action is to simulate different aspects of the partner's action timing. One such aspect is the onset of a partner's actions that one intends to coordinate with. Now, um, the task that we use in the studies, and this is uh, Dimitris Kurti's work, and this is an EEG study, um, is uh, a very simple one. So basically, the task is a handing task. So there's a candle in the middle of a table, and there are sitting three people around it. Uh, and we only need to look at partner A and partner B, because the confederate is basically just making sure they're doing the right thing, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, doing things the electrode, okay? So we look at partner A and partner B, and they sometimes perform individual actions and sometimes joint actions together. Okay, so the way this is done is there's a candle in the middle of the table, there's a plate mounted on top of the candle, and we project action cues on the top of the plate, okay? And uh, these can be different cues that people know in advance. So if you see this cue, you know that uh, none of the two partners should do anything. It's a no-go cue. If you see this cue, partner A knows that he or she should perform an action, 
and partner B knows that he shouldn't, he or she shouldn't. Okay. Same for partner B. There's a, this is the individual action cue for partner B, and then we have two more cues that are joint action cues. So this one says partner A should pass the candle to partner B. So basically, this is a cue that requires an action where A goes to the candle, lifts it, and gives it to the partner. So B also, uh, once uh, A has uh, initiated his or her action, um, initiates a receiving action. In the, in the individual action case, people actually perform a simple lifting action. So they go to the object and lift it and put it back. Okay? All right. Now, what we do is we record EEG from both partner scarves while they are preparing actions. Because what happens is after they see the uh, cue stimulus, they are told to withhold their response for a second, okay? Until the second uh, cue comes, it's an imperative stimulus, it just means that's a go signal. So we have basically one second where both are preparing their action, okay? And we, we can look at the EEG signal, signal that's uh, basically related to preparing the action. Does that make sense to you? That's a, it's important to understand. So there's the first cue, it tells you what to do, and then you have one second to actually prepare what you do, and then there's a second cue that tells you, now do it. Okay. All right. So the first bit of data that I want to show you from this experiment is uh, the movement onset times. This is when people actually start to initiate their action. The time after the go cue where the people start to initiate their action. You can see that the giving action in the joint condition, pick, you know, the person who picks the candle up, starts much earlier, about 400 milliseconds earlier than the receiving person. Okay, so it's a bit of a sequential action, right? So the giver starts earlier than the receiver. Now let's look at the EEG signals. Okay, what we are looking, going to look at is a component that's called the motor CNV. Um, and basically what we do is we um, subtract the no-go condition from three different conditions. We subtract it from a, from a condition um, uh, where basically people perform an individual action. So that's the green line. Now here, you know, a person sees, okay, um, I, have to perf I have to lift a candle, and then has a second to prepare it, and then 200 milliseconds before the actual get go cue, you have this rising component that stands for premotor and motor activity in the person. Okay? So, what happens in the condition where the person has to lift the object is that it rises until the person performs a response. Remember that the reaction times for the giving and for the lifting is the same for about 400 milliseconds, yeah? So the peak is basically, you know, when the action is initiated. Can you, can you follow that? Okay. Now let's look at the, at the joint condition. So the, the green one is when the person just does it herself. In the second case, the give condition, that's the, uh, the violet line, uh, basically it looks the same as the green. You can see that it rises until the person uh, initiates the giving action. Now the stunning finding I find <laughs> is that exactly the same happens in the person who is receiving the object. Remember that this person initiates her action only 400 milliseconds later. So it's impossible that the peak here is related to the receiving person's own action. Okay? The only thing it can mean is that there is as much motor activation for in the receiver 
who is not performing an action here, actually, um, as in the giver. And in our view, this is pretty strong evidence that what happens uh, in the preparation period is that, in a way, basically, um, the motor system in the observer uh, gives you a pretty accurate estimate <laughs> of the onset of the giver's action. And uh, if I showed you, uh, if I showed you uh, more of the data, you would actually find in the receiver you'd, you'd find a second peak here. Did you make a control where you show that it could not just be action observation? So like, you know, watching the other doing this, but you don't have to receive it? Is that? Oh, that's your individual action, right? No. That's the individual action. But not quite. I mean, if you know, if, if, this, if the individual action would really be the same from the viewpoint of the giver, like trying to hand over, not just lifting. I mean, it's a different action. Right. But see, the issue is perhaps it's not even so different. Yeah. Um, because, of course, you need to take the other's actions into account. But it's predictive, right? I mean, the, the go signal comes only here. And uh, you know the blue, blue line starts to rise in the same way, actually, as the other two. In the you know even before the go, before any action is initiated, you know it starts building up, sort of predicted. I mean, so I, I I would say it's not it's not just action observation. It's close. It's closely related to you know action uh, simulation during act action observation, of course, because. Um, you would find similar components if you expect another person that's observed, that's actually where the paradigm comes from, you know, from Kilner. Um, that's sort of, that's sort of you're looking at exactly the same component, basically. But wouldn't also part of, I mean, before, of the thing before the CNB part, before the GoQ, yeah. be just the expectation of the GoQ? That's the other question I have. I mean, you would get a CNB with expectation of any stimulus about which you make predictions, right? Yes. Uh, so, and the GoQ but is, is, your, is your flip in the... Does it help that we subtract a no-go condition? Because you would see the same Go, you know, yeah. GoQ. Also, if the first Q tells you... Um, yeah? I think that should solve it. So, I think, you know, for us the interesting point is many people's intuition is that... Um, uh, that in a sense, if you if you run one simulation, perhaps you can't run another one. So yeah, as if there is is a is a is a is a resource limit uh, on this simulation because it, they think about it as imagery and so on. But I think one thing we are showing here is that you can sort of uh, use your motor system perhaps at the same time to you know prepare your own action but to also simulate somebody else's actions in a co coordinated manner. That would be the idea. That's a, uh, I, I don't think we have sort of, you know, a killer evidence for this interpretation, but that would, that's sort of the most interpreta interesting interpretation of the finding. Because in order for you know, simulating another's actions to be helpful for joint action coordination, this is exactly what you need to do. You need to coordinate you know, what your planning of your own action with you know what what you simulate about the other's actions, otherwise it won't help you with the coordination. Yeah. Do you have any questions on this? Okay. Can you give me a time? Uh, we are one hour in or fifty minutes? Well, it's fifty-five minutes again. Okay. We can go for. Something I think I'm. Now, one more uh, data point to actually support uh, the, our interpretation of the findings is uh, looking at the correlation between the motor CNV in the receiver um, with uh, the, basically the improvement in coordination that's observable here. So basically, over consecutive trial in these experiments, what happens is that, uh, that the uh, uh, Asynchrony between the, the two action onsets, where you actually you know prepare the giving action, and where you initiate the receiving action, that they uh, that this uh, time becomes faster. 
Okay, so they, you know, it's, goes, it's sort of better coordinated in a sense. So you can see how this goes down. And what this uh, correlation here shows, this significant correlation here shows is basically that those people who have a higher motor CNV in the receiving condition belong to pairs that have more of an improvement over the consecutive trials. Okay, so this creates, this actually creates a direct link between the brain component and the performance component, the coordination component. Okay. All right, so that was, that was sort of the first part of the simulation story. Um, let me show you a second experiment uh, that's purely behavioral, uh, where we made uh, another attempt to find out um, whether people can actually sort of integrate simulations of their own action timing and another's action timing. So uh, this time it was simulating the duration of a partner's actions or difficulty that one intends to coordinate with. And uh, we also were asking whether this, you know, general strategies as well as the simulations can be combined. It's uh, Cordula Vesper again. And we looked at jumping. So the question here was, how do people uh, who are asked to jump different distances coordinate their landing times? Okay? So in a sense, when you jump a small distance, you know, uh, you, it takes you a shorter time. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easier task than uh, when you jump a larger distance. So this was a task where people didn't share any visual feedback about one another. So we also wanted to look again at sort of the advanced planning that people uh, 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 do uh, in this situation. Uh, because, I mean, that allows us to talk of simulation. Um, and in our task, a good strategy for a person who jumps the larger distance, if, if, if you jump a different distance, is maybe you can imagine this. Imagine yourself standing uh, on a spot, you know, on one foot, <laughs> here's a curtain, and next to you is another person that you don't see, and you know how long you have to jump and how long the other person has, has to jump. That was the task, yeah? So, in this, uh, in this uh, we were trying to create this situation so that it was a good strategy for the person who jumps a larger distance to jump as fast as possible, which is the speeding strategy, again, we talked about, and a good strategy for the person who jumps shorter distance to simulate the duration of the other's jump and uh, adjust to it. And the question is, is this what uh, people actually naturally do? And, and do you find these combinations of, you know, uh, this more strategic speeding, you know, working on your own task and simulating the other's task? Yes. But, but they were next to each other. They didn't see each other, but they could hear. The uh, no, they were uh, headphones. Ah. <laughs> so <laughs> it was really, um, yeah. So uh, this is, was our experimental setup. So basically you have a, uh, we had this uh, uh, setup where you had a starting position, then you know, on, on a queue both stepped forward, and then it was indicated to them uh, whether to jump uh, a distance of 30, 60, 90, or 120 centimeters. Okay, so that's, and 120 uh, on one foot is already quite <laughs> difficult. So they were jumping on one foot for motor because uh, uh, we needed that. Okay, um, and basically the only thing that you know about the other person is um, how far they have to jump. So basically the green light indicated, a green LED indicated uh, how far the person on the left had to jump and a red light indicated how far the person on the right had to jump. So by, I, yeah? by, by jumping fast, this means starting the jump fast. Yes, initiating the jump fast. Yeah, I'm talking about onset. Yeah. Because Sorry. Making the jump is such fast. We we'll look at that too. Okay. So, um, you know, that's why it's called Flying Dutchman. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. all right. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And the only feedback, so they, the only feedback they know, they get about one another is asynchrony. Because, you know, when they land on a mat, mat uh, that releases a beep on both sides. So they he hear two beeps over the headphones uh, that tell them whether they are asynchronized or not. 
So this is how it, it really looked. So this is sort of filming the two people on the two, uh, two sides of the curtain. And on the right, uh, these data basically show you uh, the distance and the, the height of, of the two jumps um, as tracked by the um, OptoTrack system. Okay, this is where they start. Now they get a cue and then they jump. And uh, here, uh, as I don't know whether you can see that both uh, basically had the same distance. Okay, so it's not necessarily too surprising that, uh, that uh, they were quite synchronous in their jumping. And the differences, of course, are very small. But here, you know, some coordination requirement is needed. This is on a very fast time scale, but the question, the question exactly is, uh, can people do anything here? So here, the person on the left is instructed by the queue to jump 35 centimeters, and the other person is uh, uh, instructed to uh, jump 140. Okay, and they know that about each other. Okay, so in a sense, the idea is that the right person here is really need, it really needs to go as fast as possible because that's sort of the other the only thing they can do to to improve the coordination. It's a speeding strategy we talked about, and that the other person. Uh, perhaps even assuming that the person here will do this, this would be a little bit of a theory of mind component, I don't know, um, actually waits, you know, with the onset to adjust for the larger difficulty of the other person jump. And the question is, can we find that? Um, I so far talked only about the joint condition that I uh, showed to you, but as a baseline, um, we also recorded two other conditions, one in which individuals uh, jumped the same distance individually on one foot, but we also had a condition uh, where um, one individual actually did the full task for the two individuals, that's why it had to be one leg jumping in the joint condition, uh, by, in a bipedal manner. So, you know, there the instruction then became with your left foot um, jump 35 centimeters with your right foot jump 140. Okay, so it looked like this, and so I can. Okay, <laughs> people had to to do this. And our prediction was actually that perhaps what people would do is take the uh, bipedal model that they have for the for their internal sort of action planning as a proxy for the joint model. I mean, we can't prove that directly, but that, that, that was a reason for actually uh, collect, collecting the individual bipedal condition. Okay. So did, I didn't get it, did subjects hear anything about each other? If it was on two sides of the no. curtain? No. So they didn't hear the landing, they didn't hear the breathing? Uh, the only thing that they heard was the landing times. So they heard, they heard a plot when you... Okay, so basically, uh, the, the experience we had as a subject is you get a cue to step forward, and both get them at the same time. And then you see how far you have to jump. And then you have to jump. But you see also what the other has to do. Yes. Both people know both tasks. Yes. And then the next you thing. You hear the sound when somebody lands on this. Tablet. Yes, and you hear that. That's the last thing that you hear. Then okay. you hear one beep for your own landing and one beep for the other's landing. You and beep? you hear the asynchrony. You get a beep, actually. Yeah. Okay, now the question is, what do people actually do in these three conditions? Let's start with a condition where basically for the self, um, the distance is short and for the partner, the distance is longer. This is the condition where people should actually simulate or wait for their partner, yeah? Because, you know, if you have the shorter jump and the partner has a more difficult task, you should wait for a particular time. And as you can see in the black line, and um, this is actually what happens in a joint condition. This is a slope here. Um, so basically, um, the movement onset is uh, longer um, in, as the uh, partner's distance increases. Interestingly, you find a similar increase in the bipedal condition. Okay? Whereas if 
the subject jumps the same distance that they are, that they are jumping here alone, there is no effect and there shouldn't be an effect. And the same is true in this condition here, where you have to uh, jump a little bit farther yourself. So I think it's best seen in these slopes. Uh, and you know, basically the slopes then for the, for the simulation that leads to the delay. If, the other, if you have to jump further than the other position, you don't see any of this slope. As you can see, the lines are completely flat here. And what that means is, that you just jump as fast as you can. And note that in the joint as well as in the bipedal condition, the times are much faster than in the individual condition. Okay, so this is uh, another, uh, another sort of uh, indication um, for, our speeding, for our speeding strategy. That was the other prediction. So basically, if you have the, if you have the shorter distance to jump, uh, sorry, if you have the longer distance to jump, then what you do is you go as fast as possible. And people do that on the fly. We don't tell them to do any strategy. So in the, in the slopes are zero in all conditions here, as you can see. Yes? Were the subjects aware in retrospect of the strategy they were applying? No. I mean, in all of the experiments I showed you so far, people are aren't aware of anything. You know, and you, if you look at sort of the time differences and so on, so this is, this is, all, this is all just how people do it, in a sense. You know, and uh, again, uh, actually here we don't have any, uh, any learning effects, despite the feedback, which is, I think, also interesting. So it's, it's as if, you know, uh, we, are sort of, we are sort of confronting them with a problem that they know. Although, you know, it, seem, it seems to be such a funny situation. Everybody does, seems to do, you know, the same. It's a very, it's a very regular pattern, actually. So, um, so this, this, this speeding strategy, as well as you know, the simulation of the other task, s seem, seem, not, seem to be not necessary things that okay, can only be done intentionally, let's say. You don't be no, no. <laughs> OK. <laughs> See, you know, also if you look at the, you know, if you look at just at the time scales here, uh, you know, this is coordination in, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a time window, you know, where the difference between conditions is 100, 150 milliseconds. I mean, there's not a lot of time for, I mean, you can think in advance, but once you do it, of course, the system has to be set to do it in a particular way. Okay, and then uh, this is something uh, for Andreas, because uh, uh, here, here are parameters actually from, from the movement data. And you can actually see that um, people are continue to actually um, to coordinate, uh, to do their, their work for coordination, uh, even if you look at the movement parameters, because that's sort of the distance that they jump. And uh, on the y-axis, it's, it's the height that they jump, OK? So if you look at, the, at this uh, blue line, basically, what happens, this is a jump where you, where you yourself only have to go 35 centimeters, but the other person has to go much longer. And the jump height here is higher than when the other person uh, you know, uh, has to jump uh, 70 centimeters or, uh, or shorter distances. Okay? <laughs> so you even get some sort of uh, effect of this. Um, in the movement parameters, and I think that I think that actually comes from you know perhaps from trials uh, where people um, perhaps through some sort of monitoring you know notice that they might be a little bit early, <laughs> and then put a little bit more force into the movement uh, through some sort of uh, monitoring process. But I think it's quite it's quite um, surprising that you would find that, and note that you know it's always the three conditions where they where they where they have where the other has to jump further, right? One, two, three. That's the three. And it's even scaled a little bit in the right way. Uh, and here too. And uh, when the other has to go further, there's nothing. Okay. Um, I don't have time to show you the data, and I don't want to go into too much detail. But uh, one other uh, uh, crazy thing is that we could actually replicate the, these, this pattern in a condition where there was no other person there. 
So we were just asking, like in, in, a, in a sort of you know, visual imagery or motor imagery manner, we just put, put them on one side of the curtain and imagine the other person, ask them to imagine the other person jumping that distance. And we should have predicted that we get the same uh, results, and we do. Okay? Yeah? So, so just one comment on this yeah. jumping higher. Do you think this could be a method to counterbalance this uh, automatic speeding up effect? And, uh, because you're in a social complex, then anyway, then you speed up, so you start a bit earlier, maybe. Ah. Counterbalance. I haven't thought about that at all. So you think we see this as a, as a, because people who simulate would still also have the speeding tendency, and that is how they compensate for it through force. It, it's possible. It's a bit of a long shot, perhaps, but uh, yeah, but it, it, it would be possible. Yes, I don't, I don't know how to to find out whether that's the case. You know, uh, yeah, oh, it would be interesting. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, we talked uh, for quite a, t a bit of time about, so we talked about three processes of uh, um, entrainment, speeding, and uh, uh, simulating. Uh, fourth related process is monitoring during joint actions. Um, and uh, it's known that uh, monitoring action outcomes um, can be a way of achieving coordination and uh, we also know that similar RM monitoring processes operate in performance and action observation. Now the question is when we perform joint actions, and now we are getting more in the sort of highly skilled domains that I was using for sort of show purpose in the beginning. Um, the question is, um, do joint action partners actually continuously monitor each other's actions, even you know, if they are engaged in, in a sort of very quick real-time performance? Um, and thus, uh, and we, we looked at that uh, by uh, trying to find out whether there is a modulation of EG error monitoring components um, during joint performance for the partner's actions and whether these uh, monitoring components are actually affected by the gravity of, the, of your own error, the partner's error, for the joint action outcome. That makes sense. Because you know, some errors uh, you just do on your own, but it doesn't affect the partner so much. Uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in the initial video, <laughs> uh, if you make an error, uh, uh, it affects your partner in the joint action outcome because they will fall, right? From the <laughs> how, how are these people called? Who, who is an English native speaker? Um, Don't trapeze? No, I should. Trapeces? <laughs> Sorry? Trapeze artists. Trapeze artists, okay. Like that. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are going to look at, uh, at two components, and our domain here is music, uh, uh, duetting pianists. So, and this is uh, uh, research that uh, Janine Leur uh, has conducted. Um, so um, it's going to be the feedback related negativity which is an early component um, that uh, reflects uh, any mismatch between expected and actual, actual feedback, and the error positivity, which is more related to conscious recognition or the motivational significance of an error. And uh, both components are elicited by altered auditory feedback in solo performance, uh, piano performance. So we, we knew sort of that you, know, you could actually find this in the, in the piano playing domain. The question is, are they also elicited by alterations of a partner's pitches and joint outcome in duet performance? Do we have some musicians here? Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, what we try to do here is to uh, manip manipulate first whether there was uh, an error or not, of course. And this could be the person's own error or the partner's error, but then we also try to manipulate whether this had more or less of a consequence for the joint action. I try to explain you how we did that in sort of musical terms. So what people were doing in this experiment, we were recording EEG while they both were playing on the 
keyboard like that. So you can actually see the actual experimental setup there. That's, that is really how it looked. So we distributed, sort of a, we had 32 electrodes on each person. And these pieces that you see here were actually composed for the experiment. And they have pretty boring music because, as you can see, you know, there's no rhythm. I mean, there's nothing for the hips here. It's, uh, if, you can, <laughs> if you can read music, it's just, uh, you know, chords, basically. Uh, um, Isochronous. Uh, Okay, but we needed that because of the EEG, because otherwise it would have been impossible to interpret the components. All right. And then what we do is, while people are playing, we actually plug arrows into their playing. So they are playing the right thing, but we plant arrows in their, in their performance, online, while they are playing. Okay? Because we know what exactly they should be playing, they have been trained to play this right for quite some time. So these are expert pianists. Um, uh, and then they press the right, uh, 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 the right key here, but we replace uh, the pitch. And this is sort of altering the individual outcome. That can happen for yourself or for your partner. Okay? And this, out this individual change can be done in a way so that the overall harmony of the four tones played together by the two people stays the same, so that, you know, in a sense, it, it doesn't matter in terms of the overall outcome, because you're, so, you're still in the same sort of chord. Or it can be done in a way that, uh, that affects the harmony and actually changes the harmony that you produce together with the other person. Okay? So in this way, what we can do is actually dissociate uh, um, uh, a pitch change that's, that's, uh, that is, that is indivi that's only uh, individual or that uh, has consequences for the joint action, or more so. Yes? Just a short question. Would, uh, why did you choose to have chords of just two notes and not just have two notes then by, uh, by the separate player? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, now, now each player is playing two notes. Yes. So basically intervals, and the intervals is four notes, Right. Yes. The pairs make a make a chord of four. Right. Why did you choose to do it that way and not with single notes, for instance, combining just in, a, in an interval? Uh, I think we needed that in order to do this uh, manipulation of you know individual outcome altered versus joint outcome altered because that's musically quite difficult to do. So we needed a certain level of complexity in order to do our manipulations. I mean, this was very tricky. I mean, this is sort of a suicidal project for an experimental psychologist. I mean, Janine got a job anyway, but <laughs> um, uh, it's a, as a postdoc project, it's a, it's a, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but we needed, we needed the complexity. It was really the easiest. This music was the easiest way to do our manipulations. Did you add a control for the effect of harmony versus disharmony as such? It no, we, could, we couldn't do that. But what we did is, oops. Because I would be afraid yes. in no, no, no. you know, this is a salient perceptual difference. Yes. And so you have a perceptual I understand. difference in the stimulus. Yes, I mean, irrespective of yeah. whoever caused it. Yeah, I wouldn't have noted this at all. But uh, because Janine is a very good musician, a music psychologist, of course, that was one of her first concerns. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't, we couldn't do it with control conditions, and you know, the experiment was three hours long anyway. Um, but the way we did it is that the actual uh, individual harmony changes were always larger in the joint outcome altered condition than the individual outcome altered condition. So that, you know, it's not just, in a sense, how should I say that? For instance, you could have had, yeah. since you say the sequences are arbitrary anyway. Right. Less harmonious accord, which is correctly played by the players. Right. Okay. I mean, I'm a bit in trouble now because I'm I'm not very firm with the music, but um, let me just tell you that uh, I think um, um, what Janine did really is to make sure that the that the harmonic change, just you know, the just the the the, the change in how melodic it sounded, let's say, was on average bigger in the joint outcome altered condition than in the individual outcome altered condition. You can actually do that. Okay. 
So it's, you know, it was here you have a change in harmony, but it sounds very harmonic, let's say. And here you say in the same harmony, but still it can be, you know, not as, as melodic or as uh, harmonic. And that's how we did it. Okay, so here you see, um, so we are uh, now going to look at uh, EEG components and basically uh, at four condition. So um, either the own part could be altered or the joint part could be altered. Uh, sorry, the partner's part could be altered and it could have uh, implications for the joint outcome or the individual outcome, okay? Remember, that was, that was our four, four conditions. And what you see here is that in all four conditions, basically, we find an FRN. And it's about the same size. Uh, as you can see in the difference curve, perhaps the easier way to plot it, I just showed this <laughs> for the EEG experts, um, is just to see the bar graphs. And here you can actually see the amplitude of the, uh, uh, the FR FRN uh, difference. Um, and here you can see that compared to a condition with no errors, you know, all of our four conditions uh, led to an equal FRN. So you get this early component regardless of what kind of error happens. Okay. The later component, the P300, you find a, a, quite a different pattern. Here, you basically um, get a, a large difference, and let me show you the bar graphs again. Here the difference is actually scaled um, by uh, our conditions. And basically what we get is two main effects. So this later er uh, uh, conscious sort of error detection component is modulated by whether um, it is a, um, a vi whether you have an, a violation of uh, of self or other. So it's higher if you make a, if your own playing if you plant a, a mistake in your own playing than when we plant a mistake in the other per in your partner's playing. But it's still significantly zero, uh, different from zero uh, for the other, at least uh, in the joint condition. The other main effect that I find very interesting that we have is that it also reflects how much implication the error has for the joint action results. Because it's in both conditions, for safe and other, it's higher than uh, for the individual sort of change in individual harmony uh, only. Okay, uh, remember this was a change where uh, the error we planted either affected or didn't affect the overall harmony. Okay, so in a sense, I think this is uh, first evidence that people do not only track the individual parts of the joint performance, but they are, that their monitoring actually includes also sort of the integrity of the joint action outcome which is different, you know, the, the, uh, the jointly produced action, especially in music, in a duet, um, and you know, also when in, in highly skilled uh, sports performance, it isn't just the two individual parts. Um, what you're monitoring here is sort of the, the overall, out, uh, uh, overall outcome of the joint action. Okay. Is this, would it suggest that the monitoring is more biased towards the joint task and the, what the other is doing? Or not necessarily. I think so. Th the early monitoring just shows us that you know you monitor everything, yeah. <laughs> your own as well as the other task, which is a little bit surprising that you know uh, the other is monitored as much as as you know your own. Within the P three hundred, isn't that further amplified in your P three hundred effect? I think in the in the uh, the P three hundred, it's more sort of like what our intu uh, original intuition is for both parts. So. Generally, it's higher for self than for other. So you know, it has to do with self-relevance, right? If I, it, it, the P3, P3 to a big um, 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 part actually reflects, um, uh, did I make the mistake or did the other person right. make the mistake, right? But it also reflects, um, you know, did we make a mistake? Mm -hmm. 
uh, versus uh, did, did the other person make a mistake? Yeah, but, but, but how do you account for the difference between these two companies, the joint and individual? How do you interpret that in, in terms of the monitoring process itself? I think because yeah. it shows you some bias, right? Yeah. And I was wondering whether the bias is going in the direction of being more that the gain of error monitoring for the joint task is that larger than for the individuals. And I was just wondering whether, whether you would interpret in these terms or not, or whether this is going over. The I'm not. I, uh, I, I'm not sure I would call it a bias. But I would uh, to post what I would like to postulate actually is a is a separate monitoring okay. process uh, for possible. the joint outcome. So you know you have a you have a you have a sort of perceptual image, let's say, um, that for the joint action, not only for your individual part, and you monitor that. And you know the the FRN uh, the FRN component doesn't allow me to say that because it's the same. <laughs> Uh, so it's the same for, for all of the conditions. Whereas here we get this scaling, and uh, so that you know my own mistake gets worse if it has a joint, uh, if, if it has more implication for the joint outcome. And the other's uh, mistake only uh, really only uh, elicits uh, uh, the P three hundred when when it has when it has or I would say us actually. Yeah, see, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. and so, but uh, I mean. You know, so far we haven't had a lot of, exp uh, of evidence that would have allowed us to argue for, for, for a joint task representation of the coordinated outcome that's sort of separate or more than the two individual representation. And I think here we have a quite clear indication actually for that. Or control parameters. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to offend anybody in terms of. <laughs> right. No, no, no. I'm just saying, you know, I, I mean, I think you could also sort of say this in terms of control parameters if we have dynamic systems people here. So, okay. Do we have some more time? Or? Of course. Okay. So let me just say something a little bit, and I don't, I don't even know to put it um, uh, about escape, but I think for. This should also be interesting for sort of a, a, a robotics community. I think all of these things should be actually, but uh, perhaps this uh, in a particular uh, way. So um, uh, we have started to explore uh, another form of coordination that has to do not so much with you know planning or visual coupling between two people, but uh, uh, more with a haptic coupling, which. Um, and in a sense, you know, uh, one has the intuition that these haptic couplings uh, could be very important because, um, you know, if you think about very early joint actions, asymmetric joint actions, where you're being carried around, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, joint actions like, like this, perhaps, uh, you know, just having uh, haptic information about a coordinated action is perhaps how it all starts, I don't know. I mean, I just want to make the point that it's an interesting phenomenon. So, we were interested in the question of whether people actually uh, solve uh, haptic interaction, haptic coordination problems in the same or a different manner when they perform, when they, when they sort of solve the same coordination problem by manually versus sort of interpersonally. And of course, the immediate difference that you can see between the two cases, and this was done by dynamic systems people for a long time, but um, uh, we have our own little version uh, for it. The main difference, of course, is that in, for a bimanual action, you have full control over both actions, and you also probably have some sort of predictive signals about, uh, uh, about both actions, whereas if you need to do the same thing in, with another person where you know, one person pulls on one end and the other person pulls on the other end, uh, you somehow need to achieve the coordination through the environment, right? I mean, you don't necessarily have uh, uh, direct information about uh, the other effector. Okay. Now, this task of the inverted pendulum is interesting because there are actually two ways to sort of solve this problem in real time. So here's the first one. So this is a sort of, uh, so the task is actually to move uh, the inverted pendulum at a certain amplitude that is indicated here and at a certain speed. Uh, let, me, let me play it again. 
Oops. Okay. And you see that uh, what Rob is doing here, it's Rob van der Weyl's work, is he's pulling at uh, in turns, so to say, right? Which implies that, um, you know, while he's pulling here, there's no haptic input here and vice versa, right? Because uh, the, the, the two um, strings are connected within the mechanism of the machine. So if you pull on one side and let loose on the other side, um, you don't have a lot of information about the other hand. So it's not that pulling on one side makes the other string move as well. That's not the case. Uh, in this case, no. Right? It does, it's only one string. So, so there is feedback. There is a connection, yes. So there is feedback. I mean, There's feedback, yeah. The hand that you're right. here, you notice here. Yes, but if you do this, if you pull on one side and let loose on the other, you, 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 uh, you produce uh, a very few feedback on the other side. Okay? Whereas in the other strategy, so you pull on both sides at the same time, and then uh, you get a lot of haptic feedback from the other hand. So actually when you say haptic, you also mean proprioceptive. Yes, right, sorry. So yeah, yeah, it's proprioceptive. Much more yeah. Proprioceptive than haptic. Yeah, okay. In the sense of mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Okay, just replace haptic with proprioceptive. Okay, so um, the question here is, you know, there's one strategy where you, where you basically don't produce uh, a lot of uh, haptic feedback for the other hand, which is uh, the strategy that people spontaneously use uh, when performing this task. So this is what everybody does if you give the task to them uh, spontaneously. But there's another one that you, that you could also use but it's more costly in terms of energy because you, you apply forces on both sides. But that's a bit specific to the apparatus you have, I guess. Yes, it is. Okay. So people have to figure this out. Um, yes, but they do very quickly. Okay. And it's, it's, in a sense, it's what we want to do because we learn, want to look at their performance and how it improves and which strategy do they adopt. Okay, I think you get the idea. Now, um, we have two, basically two conditions here. So the bimanual condition and the bipersonal conditions, and we have nine different conditions that are very, um, they vary sort of the task difficulty. Uh, we have three amplitudes and three tempos, but uh, this doesn't really matter. So we, we shouldn't, we can basically ignore them for the rest. So, can our, I can you Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Actually, each subject is seeing the other one's hands and everything. Yes. So it's not like a condition where you just see the pendulum. Yes. And you know someone else is pulling, but you, they have the full picture, basically. They have the full picture. Because I would think this, so, so it's not only proprioceptive feedback. I mean, it's it's confounded with visual, yes. It's visual feedback about the pendulum movement and about the arm movement of the other. Uh, in fact, you have body movements, postural adjustments, and things. So it's very complex feedback. Right. Situation. I just want to understand how it works. It's true, but the same is true in the bimanual condition, right? For the two effectors. So if you look at it, at it as, yeah, a, sure, yeah. as a... I don't think, I don't think you know, that if you're moving your own arm, you look at it to discover how it's moving. You know, it's a different thing. Well, the, the, the I mean, visual feedback plays a different role if, you know, if it's my arm or if it's your arm that I'm watching. Right. I think but on this, it's the same deal, though. It's a bit of difference. So in that case, you don't have a split brain, so you can really, you know. You can well, get the, the difference is, feedback. in that case, there's proprioceptive and exactly. feedback about both things. That's it. Yeah. And in that case, I only have proprioceptive exactly. feedback about both. Except when they're Siamese twins, <laughs> which he has considered. <laughs> I so I think you know if you. Well, the situation is, is complex and different. Yeah. I th I think it's complex, but I think. It's not a systematic difference between the two conditions that you have visual feedback or not. Still have these, yeah. No, but it's good that you just know now where the attack is going to come from, from Andrea, yeah. after you showed your results. That's fine. So it's okay. That's fine. We can handle that. No? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so, um, basically, what's nice about this task is actually that the interpersonal as well as the bimanual performance uh, is the same. Uh, in diets, which is the black lines, and individuals at different uh, levels of uh, 
of, uh, let's say, a task difficulty. So um, here we have a task that allows people to be, you know, equally good, let's say, with their two hands and with uh, uh, and interpersonally. Uh, so that uh, and what's nice about this is that we can actually exclude performance differences as an explanation for other differences that we may find. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at uh, you know also the trials here, we have a nice learning curve. When we look at uh, you know how well they sort of hit the instructed endpoint, you can see um, that this decreases linear. That this, this decreases in a really nice uh, learning function, and that these two learning functions look very much the same for the diets and the individuals. Can you see that? That's really trial by trial. So it's it's exactly the same. Okay, so no performance differences. So it's a bit surprising that if you look actually at the force overlap between the two strings, the force that they apply, um, so basically the amount of time where they, uh, both of the participants uh, apply force to a string, which stands for this strategy, yeah, overlapping force, and not for this strategy, you find uh, a huge difference um, between individuals over across all conditions and the diets. Which basically means, I showed you these two strategies in the beginning, that basically, uh, you know, to, well, if you do this alone, you do this <laughs> to keep the inverted pendulum stable. If you do it, uh, in, if two people do it together, they do this. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, why, okay, an interesting finding, I think, is that they, that they have a larger force overlap. And um, I have some more data on this. So, so there was no condition in which the two subjects had to pull at the same time? I mean, in the no, 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 no. You showed this alternating pulling of the two hands, and they, you know. We didn't, instru we didn't instruct a strategy. This is sort of what they picked. And uh, interestingly, you can also see that uh, basically this force overlap occurs mostly in the middle of the trajectory. So what, it, what this is plotting is basically uh, the different, oops, the different, uh -oh. the different spaces where the pendulum can be in. So this would be, you know, very far on the left. This would be around the turning point, and that would be very far to the right. That's uh, the way to read these graphs. So you can see that the first force overlap actually occurs in the region, in the middle region, uh, where the pendulum sort of um, switches from one side uh, to the other, and that's exactly where the uh, coordination needs to take place. And in the individual case, um, the force overlap is the same across all of these different positions, uh, under all sort of conditions of task difficulty. And in the diet condition, um, they produce uh, both people are sort of pulling exactly in the moment when they actually need to achieve the coordination. Okay? So that our conclusion from these results is um, that what people are actually trying to do here, uh, and I'm not sure whether this is conscious or unconscious. I mean, people didn't necessarily report this to us. But they sort of naturally adapt a, a, a strategy where they, uh, where they maximize uh, the proprioceptive uh, input for one another. But this is, this is fair, because yeah. with this apparatus, yeah, I don't fully understand it, but yeah. for, the, for the diet, also for the diet, there's only two ways to, to solve the problem. Either they pull in a single yeah. fashion or in an alternating. There's nothing in between, because no. the thing would have moved. Right. right. I mean, it's a very constrained apparatus, right. yes. So this discretization you get in the solution space is also just a property of the apparatus itself. Right. So is it unfair to say, ah, they pull exactly the time when they need to coordinate their action, because actually you didn't give them any other options. Um, but you can do it otherwise. In, and but individuals that's too. This, right? That's a simple thing. That's this. Oh, yeah, the alternating one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, but, but, but they, they only have two options. So, so the point is, they, they could only pull either in this synchronized fashion yes. or in this alternating right. fashion. 
right? And so, but you say now that they pull in the synchronization, that aha, uh -huh. isn't it amazing that they pull the string exactly at the point in time that they should be pulling it? I think the point I want to take out of this is, okay. you know, we have the same coordination problem for you know two hands versus two people, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and uh, um, what we actually try to achieve with this apparatus, and one way of uh, trying to get cle clean results with that, was actually to show very convincingly that you know you could actually achieve the very same performance uh, with very different means. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it just shows us that um, that you know uh, coordinating across subjects has different constraints. Um, than you know, coordinating with it within a person. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, as an experimental psychologist, I, I never can deal with any full complexity. So what I need to do is constrain. You know, I have sure, to be a minimalist, yeah, sure. and that's that's what we did, right? So we had oh, very two, two very clear outcomes, and we you know we we found sort of a huge difference between the two cases. The, the individual movement frequency is the same. Right, because when I'm a single person yeah. alternating, yeah. I'm moving my limbs at the same right. frequency. As if, if I'm part of a diet, it's fully right. synchronized. But uh, yes, and uh, what we can show is that uh, regardless of, what, of, of at which speed you perform, you know, of whether you get a signal to do this very fast or very slow, or whether the amplitude is sort of uh, 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 very wide or very close together, so you turn a lot or not, the pattern always remains the same. So you need a whole, at least you know, in our minimal task space, it holds everywhere. Right. So it's not, it's, not, it's not affected by any of the task parameters. You can see you know, the difference is smaller or larger in particular conditions, but that is why we actually uh, included uh, the, the, uh, this uh, variation right. in, in the task parameters. But my, how about my alternative interpretation to further uh, derail your talk? You could also argue that individuals have, a, let's say, a preferred frequency at which they make their movements. Right. Right. And if you work in the diet, pulling simultaneously and yeah. operating at that frequency, yeah. uh, as when I work as an individual, pulling in an alternated fashion. No. So I'm just, oh, I'm just converging. I understand. But if you look at this manipulation, where it's a short uh, period yeah, versus uh, long yeah, period, okay. You know, it, should, it would predict the difference between yes. this and this. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So. Yes? Can I also copy the Okay. So, well, uh, I think that in this experiment, you actually show two things, both of which are very interesting. So, uh, you show two effects of the signal, so uh, simultaneously. So, uh, on the one hand, you, uh, you are uh, forced. So is in a sense a signal, so a selling pure is a quality or a coordinator signal yes. to say, okay, do it now, do it good now, good now. Yeah. Right. That's one level. Yes. The second level is that you also uh, establish a common strategy. Yes. So at least in my interpretation also, in yes. the studies that we have done, those are two distinct levels. Yes. Those are two distinct effects of the mm -hmm. signaling. So one is related, so you could have removed this choice of two strategies, just uh, instruct the people to do this. In that case, you, you will only see the, the first effect of signaling, so the, the, the timing. Right. Do it now. Yes. At the same time, here you show the signaling has two distinct effects, coordinating the, the timing and coordinating the strategy, so establishing a common goal. Yes. So I, I think it's nice to, to keep those two things. Right. I think that's a very interesting observation. I, I, th I, I agree. I have to think it through, but uh, yeah, I, I think that's very good. So, um, okay, so I think I'm, I'm a bit over the time. I had some data across agency in joint action. I just want to perhaps, you know, I don't want to go into, into any details, but, you know, one interesting topic, and uh, we, we don't understand that yet at all, but one thing we are working on at the moment that I think is also highly, highly relevant for those of you who work in robotics and, you know, interesting human uh, computer interaction is, you know, how, is, how, how much control do people actually feel during joint actions and during social interactions in general? And uh, we had some very interesting findings from this task 
um, uh, where, from where we actually are just asked them, you know, how much individual control they actually felt, you know, over the over the outcome of the joint action. The results were a bit, little bit disappointing, uh, so I won't uh, I won't share them with you now. But I think that's I just wanted to mention it because it's I think it's a quite an interesting topic. Okay, so just to wrap up. Um, so uh, the question we started with is, you know, how do people actually achieve coordination with each other during joint action? And I think uh, so far, you know, philosophers and uh, other cognitive scientists always were sort of more looking for one solution. For instance, Tomasello, you know, and Bradman would uh, would say that commitment is very important and so on. Um, and I want to add to that, it's not an alternative approach that looking at what, you know, what we often call the nuts and bolts of joint action, looking at how coordination is actually achieved will actually teach us a lot and is absolutely necessary to actually understand the, the, the underlying mechanisms. Um, and I've talked about five of them, but I think you know, uh, uh, hopefully in five years the list will have ten or <laughs> Something like that. I think there are, there are many different ones. And of course, that also creates a puzzle of how they work together. But I've t uh, talked about five of, of these mechanisms. One is entrainment. that doesn't presuppose any sort of internal control parameters or representations at all. Uh, the second one was speeding, which was uh, I basically um, uh, try to alter the performance on my own task in order to make uh, the coordination possible. The third one was simulating others' actions, where basically what I do is I simulate what you need to do, per, for instance, the timing of your action, in order to adjust my own action planning to it. Um, and you know, here, uh, I think uh, for very high-level ex uh, experts like these trapeze uh, artists, um, you probably uh, could uh, imagine forward models here, or internal models here, where the other actually becomes sort of a prior, you know, in your model. Because at least if the other's performance is becoming very regular, um, uh, something like this uh, could happen. Uh, that would also be interesting to explore further. Then we were talking about monitoring others' actions in the piano study, and the surprising finding there was that actually perhaps there is a, a separate monitoring mechanisms actually for joint action outcomes uh, that you know that that sort of monitors whether the coordination is going right in addition to monitoring the individual parts and um, uh, last uh, we were talking about haptic signaling uh, and I think this is something we uh, want to explore much further because uh, I know for a fact that this is uh, quite a uh, important in robotics if you think about all of the you know, support help uh, uh, sort of robots that are currently discussed. Of course, uh, what they need to do would be to adjust uh, to, for instance, an old person's movements on a millisecond basis. And they would, you know, they would need to predict, and it's exactly these types of mechanisms that would uh, need to be uh, in place uh, in these robots. Okay, so no, yeah. I think we're done. <laughs> Gunter, how long yeah. is the list? How long will the list be, you think? We should say, look, we're going to have more of these. But do you expect, like, dozens or no. ten? I, to be frank, I don't know yet. But I mean, it's, I don't think it will be a very, very long list. Um, I think uh, the, the next challenge is more like how these things work together, you know? And how do you, how does the system sort of decide, you know, which one of them to use? I mean, how, you know, why, why do you come into my lab uh, in the jumping experiment, and you know, from and you know, these tries are randomly intermixed, right? So from one try to the other, you you either speed up, right. or you you use simulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now speeding up. Yeah. Why don't you see that as a form of signaling? Um, it, it's just uh, like the way I define it was just sort of um, um, it, it's a very general process, whereby basically people by speeding up, reduce the variability of their performance. 
And that in itself uh, uh, um, allows them to reduce asynchronies just you know by uh, by sort of a statistical <laughs> necessity so to say so in a sense you know you can do that when you don't know the task of the other at all because for simulating it for instance you would have to have some sort of action knowledge about what the other person you know is doing whereas for the for the speeding you can you can always do that and so it becomes uh, almost a little bit of an alternative explanation for some cases of social facilitation i find it quite yeah. interesting so So, uh, and, uh, I wonder, uh, for entrainment and speaking, for example, how much is this influenced by the experience of that development? How would this work in young kids? And uh, also, in case of simulating, are there actions? So, how do the results change when um, you cannot simulate them? You don't know how to perform the actions the other person. Right. So, in the case of entrainment, I think that would be a very basic. So, it, it, you know, that's why we we need to separate these processes because uh, the the it, the, uh, the answer depends on which process we are talking yeah. about. So, for entrainment, I think it's there very early on, and we actually know that from uh, from Trevathan's work from the se back in the seventies, he did sort of fascinating studies on you know breastfeeding where you, could, you can actually show that uh, entrainment processes are, pre are present on the first day you know, between mom and, and the kid during, uh, during breastfeeding. Of course, you have a haptic physical coupling there, but it's a very sort of tightly coordinated pattern. Um, and you can actually show that the infant helps to achieve this pattern, right? So entrainment would be one that's really there early on in infancy, and it's also one that's early there in evolution. So you know, fireflies can do it basically. So um, for the speeding one, I think that has that probably has a cognitive component, right? I don't know, uh, but you know, we had this difference between an instruction where you are instructed to coordinate yourself with another person. So you, that would probably require to set, to set up the system in a particular way, even you know, thinking about the other person. So I wouldn't expect uh, this to happen bet be between before four or five years. It's really, I think there's some theory of mind component in there. And, and so on. So uh, for simulating others' actions, that's one that's again more automatic. But you, you need, in, in this one, you really need experience so, so that you would even predict that, you know, if two people have, uh, have uh, two different styles, let's say, of doing the same thing, you'd get uh, systematic biases in, you know, how, how they make mistakes uh, in simulating the other's performance. And then the, the high art of simulation, you know, in the expertise case for trapezes would be to actually take the other person into your uh, internal model. So I, in, I think you know for these highly skilled actions, um, the other person really becomes part of your motor systems. It's a bit it's a bit spooky somehow, but I think that's how I would imagine it. Stay out of the motor system. <laughs> no, no. But even sorry, just you know, just I think that's a fascinating point also for robotics because if you think about you know you li you lift you lift the um, the box alone versus I'm lifting it with you, and then you know depending on on you know how how uh, I mean, you're very strong, so I wouldn't lift a lot. Andreas is maybe not so. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but you know what I want to say, right? So, you know, it, it really also depends on how the other person is looking and so on. Uh, and then what you have to achieve is you, you know, you, the whole dynamics for, for you know, the whole uh, way of setting your motor system uh, changes completely. So, you know, uh, and your individual experience doesn't really help help you so much unless, oops, oh, I will be late for that. <laughs> um, um, but it's striking, right? And I, you know, I think for roboticists, of course, the challenge is to, to think about, you know, how could you make uh, your, your planning and motor units uh, sort of, you know, deal with this. Uh, so I was just going to ask in line with what you were just talking about, about the, um, to what extent you can see this joint action being, um, making more sense to describe it as a um, single unit performing the action again, rather than two individuals. Um, and wondering in that respect whether you, um, in the experiments you talk to people about their 
subjective experience and about their ability to enunciate what they're actually doing. I yeah. Think that's different yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's that's a very interesting uh, issue, of course, and it's also very interesting to philosophers because they have a big sort of ontological debate, really, you know, about whether you know institutions or you know couples performing things together are sort of a different type of unit from an individual human being, and it's a big debate. And you know, uh, one, some philosophers say it's sort of just a coupling between individuals and others say it's something else altogether and we should actually change the level of description. I tend to be on the individual level because I'm a psychologist, but uh, I think uh, dynamic people who are interested in dynamical systems have a few sort of convincing cases um, where, where you could argue um, that, you, that you know, the, the higher unit should become the level of description. So if you think about um, um, uh, you know, roundabouts in traffic, I think these are probably better described in terms of, of the overall patterns than the individual psyche of the driver, for instance. Okay? But um, 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 I think for the cases here, for most of the stuff, um, uh, it w it wouldn't, I wouldn't give up the individual level of description, let's say. And have you looked at their ability to enunciate? Oh, and then we had a disappointment because we actually thought that, you know, um, uh, joint action could lead to a flow experience. And, you know, if you talk to musicians, uh, it ought to be there. It ought to be there in artistic performance. We've never been able to, to, to find a, an experimental paradigm. Uh, I mean, we start another, we, we, we will really start, hopefully, uh, soon a, another attempt with improvisation. Uh, where you know people can get together more or less, you know, during the improvisation, and uh, where, they, where they sometimes report that uh, the degree of coordination actually makes them feel like losing their self, right? If 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 it's gone really well in music, it's almost like you lose yourself. But it's very hard to create these experiences. So most of the time, and don't forget that joint actions can people also make more self-conscious. Because we once interviewed undergraduates in Birmingham, at Birmingham University, especially if you ask women about dancing with others. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this was probably sexist. But then, you know, what, what, what the students told us was that they, they actually, you know, weren't considering the others at all. They were, they were really, you know, only, only sort of focused on their own dance performance. And were they doing well? Sorry? Were they doing well, actually? Uh, that we didn't, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't look at the performance That's actually. It was, it was yeah. just students. The, believe it or not, rugby was the, was the, was the, was the sport was the sport where we got the most sort of, uh, you know, I'm part of the team descriptions. But this was verbal interviews, you know. But it makes sense. It does make sense, yeah. So joining it, the next. Yeah, no, so, so just to go, it's a follow up to your question, in a sense, it's a, uh, just a follow up on that. So, a, another way to frame this uh, debate between uh, is it individual or is it uh, complex dynamical system stuff that I also try to, to, I try to comment on this on my own presentation also. So, another way, if you want to keep the individual situation, you can explain collective phenomena by just saying that people are happen to optimize the same goal, which happens to be a joint goal. Right. Just for that, you keep your individuality in a sense, but because to do a joint goal, you also have to take into consideration the parameters, parameters of the others, right. the actions of the others. Then everybody is individualistic, but the, col the result, the emerging result is some collective action. So that's another... Uh, do we have half a minute? Sure. Uh, actually, yeah, just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the that's the agency data from the from the rope pulling experiment, and the most disappointing part of it is the joint condition, because uh, what happens is that in the joint condition, regardless of how much people improve in their performance, they will report fifty percent agency. So it's pure exclusivity. So if you're doing the task together, you know, it's, bo it's a boring result, but it's, it's also good to know, I think. You know, what you would expect uh, somehow is that perhaps people, you know, over time lose their sense of agency or something happens, you know, to these findings, uh, but nothing happened at all. The only thing that we got, 
maybe it's better to see in this graph is that you know if you come out of a joint action then uh, start to perform the task individually you're very relieved so you have this huge increase in control feelings yeah but uh, I mean we have whenever we've tried to to record uh, agency judgments for joint performance you know with the intention to actually find a pattern like you were suggesting uh, we've had a uh, uh, bad results. Yeah, the build to your task. Yeah. It might be very difficult because you make it, it so be. obvious to your subject yeah. that okay. you are only providing 50% of the force to this pendulum. It's true. Right? It's true. Uh, this is why our next experiments on joint agency will actually work with perturbations. Um, and then, you know, you don't know how much of the perturbation is to your own action and to the other's action that solves the problem. Right. right. I mean, we're just starting. I mean, it's, and it's difficult, so. Uh, sure. Yeah. Then there are some announcements, I think, by Anna, you have some announcements? So, so let's first thank our speaker again. Yeah,